Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning to see you all here today. And uh, today we're going to continue on with the uh, Sermon on the Mount, looking specifically for the next few weeks, at least on the, on the Beatitudes. And today we're going to be looking at uh, Matthew 5 5. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. I really enjoy these Beatitudes because, in part, because when you they, they seem so simple, they seem so straightforward. But when you really look at them and, and understand what Jesus is saying in the context of the kingdom, there's quite a bit of depth in these, and so I think that's especially uh, true with, with this one. Um, now, some of you, uh, if you're on the more elderly side, may remember a uh, comic character by the name of Casper Milk Toast. He first appeared in 1924, that's why I say, you know, some of us haven't, wouldn't have gotten here, but maybe some of us would, uh, in the comic The Timid Soul, where he entertained the readers through his timidity, through his literal interpretations of signs, and for his refusal to engage anyone in discussions that would turn into controversy. One of these comics had Casper standing outside in the pouring rain, completely soaked, hat just down around his ears, saying to himself, well, I'll wait one more hour for him, and if he doesn't come, then he can go and borrow that hundred dollars from somebody else. <laughs> Is that kind of a person? And from the character of Casper Milk Toast, this phrase Milk Toast, and it's spelled M-I-L-Q-U-E-T-O-A-S-T, uh, has entered our English vocabulary, and it's something that we still hear occasionally tossed around today. A milk toast is a person who is timid, who is afraid to stand up for himself, and a person who is worried about the backlash from whatever he might say. And it's almost always used when it is used as an insult, such as in any concerns that Mitt Romney will adopt McCain's milk toast campaign model are quickly diminishing, and these are real quotes. Or the New York Times claiming about Paul Ryan that he, quote, sent a spokeswoman out to issue a milk toast defense of the special counsel. You know, kind of wee, wishy-washy, yeah, kind of a thing. <laughs> you know, you mentioned meekness, and I think most people immediately think of the milk toast variety. In fact, Merriam-Webster actually defines milk toast as a timid or meek or an unassertive person. And unfortunately, I think for many of us, that, that with, with the first reading of this beatitude, blessed are the meek, that's the idea that carries over to our understanding. But I, I want to just talk about it. Yeah, I don't think that's correct at all. Blessed are the, blessed or happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the world. And here is another one of Jesus' countercultural statements that simply fly in the face of conventional wisdom. You know, it's a nice sentiment. Oh, blessed are the meek, happy are the meek. Isn't that sweet? You know, Wally Wall, Wall Power is going gonna, is gonna to be happy. But, you know, let's be honest. Meekness is not normally conceptualized as high on people's list of admirable qualities. You know, in a job interview, when the interviewer, you sit down across the desk and he says, tell me, what is your greatest strength? And you say, well... You know, my greatest strength is my meekness. <laughs> and you, you know what's going to happen next. He said, well, thank you for coming in, and here's the door, and we'll be in touch. <laughs> or, you know, I'm sure none of us are on Match.com, the dating site. But, you know, if you post a picture up there, and you're describing your characteristics and your attributes, and you say, my greatest attribute is meekness. <laughs> you know, there, there's not a lot of women out there looking for that quality in a man. And so... Uh, you know, I, I think in our society today, with this, this milk toast variety of meekness, you can look far and wide and not see much of it. You know, this, this last summer, for example, we saw images of these nightly protests that just degenerated into riots and looting and burning in just major city after major city, even cropping up over in Davenport in our own, in our own quad cities. You know, not a lot of meekness there. And in the past few weeks, you know, we've witnessed the conflict between the Democrats and the Republicans about the COVID, uh, COVID assistance bill and the two sides each locked into their own view of what they want to do, bickering and fighting and back and forth. All the while, you know, there's people in America that are losing homes and jobs and businesses and just waiting for some kind of help that doesn't seem to be coming. 
Um, not a whole lot of weakness uh, to be seen there. And then this whole political process that we're involved in right now, leading to the election in a couple of weeks, you know, and you got countless permutations on every possible media and communication chat channel of candidates putting forth lies and half-truths about their opponents while lavishly embellishing their own accomplishments and plans. You know, it's a bit hard, a bit hard to find meekness in that mess. You know, our cultural icons today tend to be those people who exalt themselves, who grasp for power, who win at any cost, who are willing to do whatever it takes to lift themselves up in the eyes of, of their, their peers. Not exactly a description of meekness. Like I said, unfortunately, for the sake of understanding our passage today, what Jesus is talking about is very, very different from this normal conception, from this normal understanding. You know, if we think of meekness in the way our society understands it, we're going to miss this point entirely. The meekness that Jesus refers to in this passage, blessed are the meek, is anything but this timid, retiring, wallflower type. It's not shyness. It's not timidity. It's not uncertainness. It's not retiring. Actually, the Greek word used here is praes, which means, and I really like this definition, not being overly impressed by one's self-importance. Not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. Being gentle, being humble, being considerate. You know, you look at that, look at it that way. I think we could all agree. I, I'd love to see some more of that in the world today. You know, wouldn't that be great if our political discourse was was governed by not having an overblown sense of our own importance. That would revolutionize things. You know, I think the best example of meekness in the biblical sense was in the life and ministry of Jesus. Jesus, in his life on earth, exemplifies exactly what he means here when he says, when he uses the term meek. You know, many years before his, before his birth, the prophet Isaiah predicted that the Messiah, when he came, would exhibit this kind of meekness. In Isaiah 5, 7, for example, and he doesn't use the word meekness but he describes it, and he talks about the Messiah when he come. When he comes, he says he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. You know, you can think of think of Jesus on the way to the cross. That's exactly what he did. It also reminds me of the, you know, back in the 60, early 60s, the nonviolent protest led by Martin Luther King against, uh, against uh, 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 with the civil rights movement. And you look at the things that those people suffered. They, they suffered greatly at the hands of the authorities and those who opposed the movement. They were beaten, they were whipped, they were tear gassed, they had dogs set on them. And yet, for the most part, those people reacted peacefully. There was a little bit of an exception now and then, but for the most part, it was very peaceful. That was you know, one of Martin Luther King's main tenets, peaceful resistance. You know, later in the Gospel, in, the, in his Gospel, Matthew describes Jesus using the noun form of this word that's, that's translated meekness in the Beatitude. In, 11, in Matthew eleven twenty nine, Jesus makes a statement, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That word gentle is the same root, root word from which we get the adjective meek. In 21.5, say, say to the daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Again, gentle being a translation of that word that's translated meek elsewhere. You know, it's clear from this that what Jesus is talking about has to be very different than our cultural conception of meekness. You know, here's Jesus, the same guy that goes head to head with the Pharisees, just hammering tongs, arguing with him, calling them vipers, calling them whitewashed tombs, driving the merchants and the money changers out of the temple, finally willingly going to his death on the cross. That is not Casper Milk Toast. That's an entirely different kind of characteristic than what we conventionally think of as meekness. Jesus, I guess to use the, the definition, Jesus was a person who was not overly impressed by his sense of self-importance. He was gentle, he was humble, he was considerate. 
over. And we see this form of meekness demonstrated throughout his ministry. You know, he's coming into the world. It wasn't accompanied by a great pomp and circumstance and amazing signs and wonders or whatever. You know, the, the things that we would think would accompany the Son of God coming to earth. No, he was born to a poor couple in the humblest of, of circumstances in a barn and his first bed was a feed trough and then the angels when they did come didn't go to the leaders and the kings to announce this amazing thing they went to the humblest of people to a group of shepherds out watching their flock to tell them about this amazing event and then throughout his life we see this meekness this sense of, this sense that you know it wasn't about his self importance it was about his service it was about his consideration. We see that demonstrated throughout his life. One of my favorite examples surrounds the feeding of the 5,000. Mark uh, chapter 6, 31 through 34. I'm going to read this because it sets, the, it sets the background for this event. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Now, that's important. Okay. So many people surrounded, bang, 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 just people everywhere. Finally, he said, we got to go get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. And Jesus goes on right after this to perform the miracle of feeding them that time. <coughs> I have to tell you, this wouldn't have been my reaction if I had been Jesus. You know, here he's been just surrounded by people, just mobbed with people bringing their sick, bringing their, their issues, bringing their problems, and he's just, it, it, oh, on and on and on and on and on. He's got these people coming to, to ask him to help them to the point where they, they weren't even able to, uh, they weren't even able to eat. They had no rest whatsoever. And finally he says to the disciples, you know, guys, we got to get out of here. We need a break. Let's go to a quiet place. Let's recharge. Let's just find out the word to use. But let's, you know, let's let's take a break. Let's catch a breath. Let's, let's get away from these people for a little bit. And so they sail across the lake to get away from these people to get a little bit of a break. And of course, you know, I just read it. People saw them coming and they're galloping around the lake as fast <laughs> as they could. He gets to where he's going. He steps off the boat and there's exactly the same mob that he just left. <laughs> All of them going, me, 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 me. You know, I don't think I've been as magnanimous as Jesus. I, I've been like, don't you people have jobs? <laughs> don't you have some place to be? Can't you leave me alone for a couple of hours so me and my disciples can get a little a bit of a rest here? Get, go on, get, 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 go home. <laughs> but Jesus reacted with meekness. It wasn't about him. It was about the people. He sat down, he saw their needs, and he cared for them, and he talked to them, and he fed them. And then amazingly, the very same thing happened again. After he fed the 5,000 disciples, he sent his disciples ahead. They, they got in the boat, you know, they're going back across the lake somewhere. Jesus stayed for a little bit, prayed for a little bit, walked on the water. That's when that miracle happened, met them out in the middle of the lake. They got to where they're going. And in Matthew 14, 35 and 36, as the place, men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak and all, all who touched it were, diff, were healed. You know, different group. Same relentless demands for attention and the same self-sacrificial reaction on the part of Jesus. You know, if you've been tired before, you must have been completely physically and emotionally and maybe even spiritually wasted at this point. And yet still, he ministers. He still heals. He still teaches. He still addresses the needs of the people around him. You know what? You read the scripture, I'm not sure he ever had the break he was looking for. You know, one more example from many is when he washes his disciples' feet before he goes to his death. In John 13, we read, the evening meal was in progress. Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. 
When he finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He said, yes, sir. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightfully so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Notice he acknowledges his position. He says, I am your teacher. I am your Lord. He never played down to his disciples who he was. They knew who he was. And because of who he was, you know, in the scheme of things, they should have been washing his feet. You know, he should have been lounging back on the chair and they just been ministering and loving and taking care of him and doing all these wonderful things for him. But he was willing to turn the cultural standards, the cultural mores on their head to teach them a valuable lesson about meekness. It's not about us. It's not about him. It's about our service to others. You know, these are just a couple of examples from the accounts of Jesus' of life and ministry, but there's a bunch of them in the of similar stories in, in the Gospels where Jesus sets aside his rights and his privileges in order to serve others. You know, the thing to keep in mind in all of this is that Jesus wasn't doing it in order to achieve some kind of notoriety, some kind of fame, some kind of fortune, some kind of position. This wasn't a means to an end for him personally. It wasn't a way to achieve earthly glory. In fact, every time somebody tried to give him earthly glory, he deflected it. He had all the glory he wanted before he came to earth. He didn't need any more glory. He was, but he was willing to set all that aside in order to serve you and me. In order to open the door for you and I to join him in heaven one day. Like I say, he didn't do this to elevate himself. He did it to elevate us. That was his only, only agenda. That's me. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19, we read, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, the beginning of and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. See what you're saying? Jesus is supreme. He reigns over the universe, powers, authorities, everything that exists exists because of and for him. And yet, he went to the cross and he shed his blood. He set it all aside for the sake of others. That's meekness. I think we see from the life of Jesus that meekness really begins with embracing a higher purpose in life than our own plans and our own desires. You know, like I say, I, Jesus is such a great example of meekness because it was obvious that it wasn't for self-serving for him. He wasn't doing it to get here. He had already been here. He came down here in order to do it. He already was greatness. If he had been worried about his position, his honor, his glory, he, would, he could have just stayed in heaven. He didn't have to come down here to achieve that. What he did come to achieve was an even higher purpose the redemption of all mankind. You know, one of the things that missionaries commonly encounter, I think every mission, overseas missionary runs into this, is the difficulty that the local people have in simply understanding why we're here. For them, in many places, getting to America is like the Holy Grail. <laughs> you know, uh, the land of milk and honey. The Papua New Guinea villagers, this... They, they had this idea that in America, you never had to work. Because, I mean, they didn't see us do a stick of work the whole time we were there. As they defined work, you know, digging in a garden and planting stuff. We were doing stuff in the office all, all day. So Americans, they, they never had to work. Stuff just shows up at your doorstep, doesn't it? You know, if they could have seen the Amazon boxes coming every day, they would, probably would have confirmed them in their suspicion. That, yeah, this is great. I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there. 
Um, and the Indonesians, you know, they had a bit more balanced view of America, but it still made no sense to them why somebody would leave America because they all wanted to come here. Why would you be there and come here and live in a humble little neighborhood like Bandung? And it just made no sense. I can't count how many times we've been asked, but really, you can tell me. I won't tell anybody else. Why are you here? <laughs> really? Why are you here? I remember in Papua New Guinea, the people asked me, you know, they, they, they never did get it. One day we decided that we were going to get some chickens because we wanted the eggs and the meat from the chickens. And so we were going to raise some chickens. And so the uh, next supply run, I had a box of chicks come on, I don't know, 20 or 30 of them in the box. And build a little chicken coop out of an abandoned hut, put wire fence around it, got it all set up, little nesting sites for the chickens. It was all great. And the people were so happy. I finally figured it out. We'd come to have a chicken ranch. <laughs> <laughs> now things made sense to them. <laughs> and the point is that, you know, as Christians, we're all to embrace a higher purpose. You know, our purpose there wasn't chicken ranch. It was to help them. And they didn't get that because it was just kind of outside their, their understanding of how things work. As Christians, we're all to embrace a higher purpose that reorients our lives around something other than ourself. And that brings us right back to the kingdom. Remember that everything Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount needs to be understood in the context of the kingdom. And that's what this sermon is all about. It's not a collection of the pithy sayings of Jesus. It is actually describing who we are and how we live as citizens of this new thing that he's instituting, this new kingdom of God that Jesus is establishing. And living as citizens of this new kingdom means in large part being willing to set aside our own objectives, our own plans, our own priorities, and replacing those objectives, plans, and priorities with the ones that, that belong to God. It means to live lives worthy of and reflective of the calling of God who is asking us to allow the person and character of Jesus to shine through us in service to the people around us. It means for us to be meek as Jesus was meek. You know, to be, to be willing to look at that crowd and say, okay guys, roll up your sleeves. We got, we got some work to do here. I think primarily, primarily for you and I, that means to focus our lives on the needs of those people who are around us, the people that God has brought into our sphere, where we have influence and the ability to serve. Which brings us to the next point. Meekness exhibits itself in our relationships with others. Again, look at Jesus in the example we discussed. In spite of his being worn out in every way by serving the people who came to them, when they, when they came again, he launched right back into service. In his final night together with his disciples, when he would have wanted to drive home the final point, the main thing that he wanted them to get, you know, you got one more shot at it before the crucifixion. What are you going to say? He washes their feet. You know, Paul describes Jesus and his humility and his meekness in Philippians 2. He says, In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I think it's interesting the way Paul starts this. He doesn't say, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. He says, in your relationships, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to describe how Jesus was willing to set everything aside to accomplish the purposes of God. Notice, too, that, and I think this is kind of a universal, meekness as Jesus defines it, Already, always requires a willingness to sacrifice. I think it's always going to require that we set aside our stuff in order to serve others. You can't exhibit, you really can't exhibit meekness in, in Jesus' sense of meekness without a willingness to sacrifice. You know, I was thinking this week about our, our church in light of this beatitude, and I came to the the conclusion that you know, we do a pretty good 
job here exhibiting meekness. I mean, last weekend we had a whole bunch of people show up, sacrifice a Saturday morning when you could have been sleeping or whatever you do on Saturday morning, uh, to come here and work on the church and to take care of the church building. You know, that was meekness as Jesus defines it. When people have been sick, the ladies and maybe even some of the guys, I don't know how many of you guys cook, but maybe, you know, people have spent the time and the money to provide food for people when they've been sick or when they grieve or when they have needs. That's meekness. You know, we have the Christmas giving for the local and the foreign children coming up, again, costing us time and money to make all of that happen. That's meekness. And this church provides generously, I might say sacrificially, I think, to foreign missions. It's money that we could do something else with, guys, but we're putting it into foreign missions. That's meekness. So I think we have a good base. You know, we have a church culture of meekness, expression, and service to others. But living the Christian life is not a static thing. It's about growth. I was talking to a friend this week, and he, the friend was saying, you know, that he's, he's a Christian, but I'm not, he's not, I'm not a very good Christian. And I replied, you know, it's, it's, it's not about position. It's about direction. It's not about where we are. It's about where we're going. And so, you know, where we are, I think, is pretty good. But we need, to, we, we, we need to still have that direction. We need to still have that trajectory. We still need to have that attitude that would cause us to grow in our meekness. And I think to do that, we need to ask ourselves and ask God how we, he would have us build on and expand on this foundation. And I think we all want to see our church grow. We all want to see, not so just so we have big numbers, but so we have impact in this community, so we see people that come to know Jesus through us. In this community, and you know, we're scattered all over the place. In all the communities that we touch, we want to see this church expand on our ministry. And I think the way we do that is to be unique as Jesus is, was meek. That is, be looking for those opportunities to serve and be willing to set aside our plans and our priorities to do that. We need to be asking ourselves, is there any more that we can do for each other? And is there any more that we can do for those others out there that maybe don't know Jesus yet? How can we more fully exhibit the meekness of Christ in the context where God has commanded us? You know, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure I haven't arrived yet. And I think I, I would just like to end today by encouraging all of us, myself included, to pray about this beatitude and ask God if there are ways that He might have us become more like Jesus in this sense. More like Him, being willing to set aside time, energy, money, whatever it takes to minister to those people that He brought into our sphere of influence. And just then do it. Be obedient to those things that God is calling us to do. Because when we do that, we'll be reflecting the person of Christ in our lives. The person described in the gospel as meek. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the example of Jesus and for the corrective example that where he displayed very, very clearly what it means to be meek. That is not timidity. It's not fear. But it's a life oriented around the higher purposes that, that you that you give us, your purposes, your plans, the things that you want to see happen. And Father, none of us here would say that we've arrived there yet, but we all want to be in it, we all want to be moving in that direction. So Father, we pray that you would open our eyes and show us ways that we can minister more effectively. Uh, in the community around us. Are there needs that maybe we uniquely could, could fill that uh, that we've just missed until now? If there are, Father, uh, bring it to our attention, bring it to our minds, bring it to our hearts. We look forward to what you're going to do in, this, uh, in us this, this coming week, Father. And we just, our prayer to you is make us meet like Jesus is meeting. It's in his name we pray.